put on the record the recording button and it's now in progress and Amy I'm going to turn it over to you yeah hi everybody um I'm Amy Hogan and I teach at Brooklyn Tech High School and you guessed it Brooklyn New York um I'm going to have everybody take turns, I guess. What did we say? We said uh, your name, uh, where you teach, um, what uh, modality you're teaching. Like, are you teaching in person? Are you teaching remotely? Are you hybrid? Um, something that has worked well so far. I think that's what we said. Mm -hmm. and then how you're getting to know your students. I think that's what we said, right? Sounds good. So who would like to start? Mary, do you want to start? You were, you were here first. Because oh, I thought it was at four, so I actually thought it was late, so it worked out all right. Doing great. <laughs> yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Mary Clark. I teach in a small school in Connecticut. Uh, and I'm teaching this year, every, because we're a small school every year, it could be a different subject that we're teaching within the math, math and stats department. So this year, I'm teaching honors stats, um, data analytics, honors pre-calc, and um, algebra two. And I've had up to eight preps in a year because we are a small school. So by eight preps, I would have like a stats class that would include kids from the most basic level all the way up to like an AP level. And I just put them in different rows. Like this, this row is gonna be AP, this row is gonna be general and this is gonna be basic and it's horrible. So hopefully <laughs> we'd never have to do that again. But um, what we are fully in person this year as we were last year. So we've only been, because we're small and the kids are compliant generally, they'll do what you say if you wear a mask you have to wear a mask we had staircases that were only in one direction and hallways and all this so we didn't miss the only time that we went virtual was from um thanksgiving to christmas that being said there were some kids last year that were remote for for meetings like they're immune compromised or something so when we taught in person last year we were doing both like on the screen for people at home plus in the classroom and i hated that and it was really hard to do programming that way. That was, I teach data analytics and that was brutal. So I'm super glad that we're not in remote this year. I'm hoping. What kind of a school are you at, Mary? I, I teach at a Catholic school. It's a small okay. uh, parochial school in Bristol, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay. And cool. so um, it's super nice to have paper tests, give them out. They all forgot how to take a test. Everybody forgot. No one knows how to do that anymore. So that's kind of funny. That's all. <laughs> Allie, do you want to go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Allie George. I teach at uh, University of North Carolina School of the Arts in their high school program. So um, I have dancers and uh, musicians and visual artists and all of that, and it's great. Um, but we're residential. So the majority of our kids live in the dorms. We have some that are local that commute in. So um, we're an interesting little world because we're, we're fully in person but we can't bubble because we have the commuter students. So we are crossing our fingers and hoping everything goes well. Um, last year I was um, fully virtual. And so me being back, it's been a challenge adjusting to back to this, this world again. It's a rough, rough readjustment, but it's going well so far. Roxy, you're, so I'm just going with my screen here. So Roxy, you're next. Okay, well, I'm Roxy. I'm um, actually I'm I'm retired, so I'm not in the classroom either virtually or uh, or in person this year. Although our campus is that where I retired from is back in person this year. Um, so I, the change that I've had to make is I do professional development, um, mostly for now two year college faculty in statistics and some uh, some high school. Um, AP people, folks, and we've had to move that to Zoom and that that hasn't gone back to in person yet. So it'll be at least the spring semester before we're thinking about possibly doing in person. But um, but anyway, so I, I have I have I have it easy compared to you, <laughs> to you guys. So. You're still welcome here, Roxy, even if you're oh, I like to hear what everybody's everybody's doing. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rebecca, you're next. 
I'm Rebecca Nichols. I work with the ASA education programs and um, I'm with Roxy. I have it easy. So I'm, I'm not in the classroom. <laughs> I was before, but I'm, it was a while ago and I'm not anymore. And uh, um, yeah, but I want to know how I can help you all. So <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> we appreciate what you do. Reagan. Everybody, I'm Reagan Davis from Chesapeake, Virginia. I teach um, at Great Bridge Middle School. I teach eighth graders in pre-algebra and honors geometry. And our, uh, our unit starting on Monday is actually probability. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and we are completely in-person after we did a blended year last year. We are 100% in-person unless a student has to quarantine. And I look forward to retiring one day. Um, I consider myself pre-retired, even though I have about another 15, 20 years to go. But pre-retired, I'll go with that. Cynthia. Hi, I'm Cynthia D and I'm out in California. Um, I'm a first year teacher, so I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you. Um, uh, thanks to Rebecca, I, I've attended the meeting within a meeting for the high school teachers. It was so good. I've been using some of the activities already. It's gone really well. Um, Cause I feel I'm, we have a small, Math, the math department's five teachers. And I, as a new teacher, I got statistics because no one wanted it. So um, I, I'm really grateful for this community um, to be able to pick your brains and ask for some support. And Mary, especially as what you said about um, differentiation, that's one of the things, because we are the only, we have one statistics class and everyone who wants to take statistics is in the same class. So I'm really trying to think hard about differentiation. I would love to get everyone's thoughts on that. So thank you. Well, welcome, Cynthia. Good luck. This is uh, very exciting, I think, to, to be starting off. If you can make it through this year, I, I would say you're, you're good to go. That's, that's been the advice I've been giving. Uh, Stephanie, you're next. Hi, I am Stephanie Melville. I am a high school math resource teacher out in San Diego, California. Uh, also not in the classroom this year, so um, we, I have it easier, admittedly. Um, but I am currently working um, largely in the capacity of rolling out data science TK-12 in our district. Uh, so I am here to see what it is that teachers would want, what they are interested in. Um, it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. And so I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm ready. I'm excited. Lee, you're next on my list. I'm Lou Kuchera. I'm an old timer. I mean, Roxy and I were table mates back the very first year. We go way, way back. Um, I retired from the high school classroom and have been part-time at UC Irvine teaching the based intro stats there. And I also give these one, you know, the, the one week summer institutes. I had eight online summer institutes this summer. They, there was, I had one, you know, offer of an, an in-person one, but I already had an online one that same week. So I did eight online, which is crazy. And I was online at UCI last year. Um, we're back in person this year and I, I'm not teaching this quarter, but I will be, I expect to be in person when we do teach this year. And I'm, Got lots and lots of resources for anybody who needs them because that's what I do. Donna. Hi, everybody. I'm Donna Lalonde and I'm at the ASA and uh, just uh, listening in. Glad to see everyone. Robert. Are you available, Robert, if you can unmute? So right now I think you're muted. I had you unmuted for about five seconds and then muted yeah. back up. I think he's having, Robert's having Mike trouble issues. with his microphone. 
Yeah. If you want to come back, you know, log out and log back in, sometimes that that's the best way to do it. We'll, we'll move. We have a couple more people. Uh, we have one, a couple of people who are using a phone number, a 646 uh, number. Uh, you can, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Christine. I'm the 646 number. Uh, I am a high school special ed teacher. I'm teaching statistics. And um, my big thing is going to be differentiating for all students. Uh, I've been doing this for about four years. So um, I'm looking forward in person to hopefully uh, get more students interested in statistics. Awesome, thank you. And then we have a 706 phone number. Are you able to unmute? All right, I see, I see Robert is coming coming in as a second. Robert, what about you? Are you able to unmute on this other? We can always come back. Chris, do you wanna you introduce yourself? I don't know if you did. Oh, did you? No, no, I don't think so, but I can. <laughs> yeah, let's round it out. Okay, hi, I'm Chris Franklin. Uh, I'm retired from the University of Georgia in the statistics department, and I'm currently the K through 12 ambassador for ASA. So I, I like to say that I have the dream job where I get to work with teachers and math educators at the school level. Um, I'm currently not teaching, except I'm like Roxy, where uh, I, I do quite a bit of professional development. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work in Georgia, especially here with the revision of our new standards. Uh, I was sharing a little bit earlier that within a span of one week, I've been able to make two presentations in person. And I, this is the first time I've been able to do anything in person since February 2020. So I'm on a high right now that I have been with human beings. <laughs> talking about statistics. Um, so I'm just excited to start the new year uh, with the chat and hear from all of you and hear about your challenges, but also the great things that are going on in your classroom. And may, hopefully you can give me some good advice for how I can improve with some of my presentations. All Hello? right, and I, I see Renee here. Uh, Robert, are you able to unmute now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yay. <laughs> uh, uh, my name is Robert Baker. I'm a, a retired uh, math, physics, and phys and uh, statistics teacher uh, in Los Angeles, California. And I'm uh, I volunteer in a school, and we're doing. Uh, something with radio astronomy and I wanna see how I can bring statistic, the data that we get from the radio astronomy into the uh, using statistics to make the data clear or get some different analysis on it. Cool, sounds fun. All right, and Renee, we're just introducing ourselves, Renee. Can you unmute yourself? There we go. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I was your 706 number. Oh, um, yay. I okay. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to unmute it. So I am actually um, a math mentor with the West Georgia RISA in, um, I live in Noonan, Georgia. And um, so I'm familiar with Chris Franklin's work. I've uh, gone to a ton of your sessions. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm here because I know statistics is going to be a big part of our new standards that are rolling out. And I'm really wanting to learn, I'm an AP stat teacher at the high school level, but I wanna learn how to get 
from kindergarten through 12th grade get it integrated because every every time I go for a crosswalk with these new standards I hear every time well we'll put statistics at the end because if we don't have time that's the unit we can leave off and so I really want to come against that because I think it's it's such great information that all our kids should be proficient in so that's me awesome thanks thanks uh, so I teach um, AP statistics, and I have uh, four sections of, of AP stats. So I'm kind of like the opposite of you, Mary. I, I have a lot. I have a large sample size, um, and we actually have 11 sections in my school. So we have five. We have five different teachers um, that are teaching it. One is teaching uh, like from a compute more from a computer science perspective, um, but he is going to try to get through the curriculum. Um, and then I also teach uh, a course called math analysis. So it's just an elective and it's like a extra curricular topics and we do math contests and have a good time. Um, and today we were doing algebra because apparently all the students have forgotten algebra. <laughs> so, um, so I am just trying to spend time, I think, re so I was uh, hybrid last year and, ver and remote. I think I did it all. And then this year we're in person. Um, and I think the students are forgetting and the teachers too are forgetting like things about being inside a classroom, like um, turning in papers, right? Like, and students are like, why do I need to turn this in in person? And I was like, I actually wanna smell your paper, which I, they all laugh at, but like, that's the joke. Like, I wanna smell your papers at this point because I'm so sick of digital digital work. Um, so getting my students used to just routines of inside of an actual classroom has been challenging, but it's been fun. It's been nice. And like Chris, I just, this is, it was exactly 18 months since I had a full classroom um, to the day, actually. So, I mean, things have been wild in New York City. I don't know how else to, I, I, I know it's wild everywhere, but I don't know, it just seems crazy. Um, and we just got done talking about um, unit one in the AP stats curriculum, which is like they thought was, they thought was gonna be easy and then it ended up being more challenging. Um, so that's, that's where we're at with the AP stats curriculum. So I wanna hear like what, what, what those of you that are teaching, what are you teaching and what are some of the fun things that you're doing? Does anybody want to just pipe in? Um, you hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. So um, right now I'm just teaching uh, experimental design with my students. Um, I just had them creating, designing their own drink because I want them to do more hands-on since it's a special ed high school. And um, over the time, they're going to be applying statistic concepts to their project. So that's the main focus that I'm doing with my students. Cool. What, are, what else are you, Allie, what are you teaching right now? Um, so we started um, about middle of August, but we have a four-day week. I only see my kids four days a week. Um, so we are halfway through unit two we're just wrapping up um in the practice practice of statistics we're wrapping up the first chapter one right now um so far it's going really well um i'm pleased they're they're hanging in there and uh but same thing they forgot how to how to in-person class and um they absolutely thought the experimental design was going to be really really easy and then it was really really not and there was a lot of angst but um they're, they're happier with graphs right now. <laughs> they're like this, I'm good at, I can do this. Um, the thing that I'm looking forward to, and I'm still trying to figure out how to make it happen. Um, our school is making a push for our seniors to do a capstone project across all the classes. And so we're calling it our citizen artist project. And so I'm trying to conceptualize what that would look like in stats. Like there's a whole bunch of opportunities, but 
Also on the flip side, that's 36 separate projects that would have to happen this year that I'd be supervising because it would be an individual project. And so that's a little daunting. <laughs> so trying to figure out where that's gonna, gonna be. I gave myself permission to like get through the first two units before I threw it at my kids. I was like, let's just everybody get back to normal first before we start to worry about that. But that's, hopefully that'll be good. I'm looking forward to it. Don't know what it'll look like it, but we'll see. That sounds fun. It should be good. I think you could have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Anybody else? What is it that you're you're teaching in your in your courses right now? So I can go accept that my dogs are barking. So I may have to cut myself off if it's too much. But um, a couple things, um, like like for a capstone project, one thing that that I did for for stats was it was almost like March Madness type of idea with the pyramid. So it was based on the 50 states so that there couldn't be any cheating and so that everybody was responsible for their own data for the first round. And I made up a scenario where they're gonna, um, there's this new high-tech COVID like facility that has to be put in one of the 50 states. Well, I think it was like including Washington DC or something. And they had to, um, look up the census, some information from the US census. And so they spent you know, weeks getting data, researching it, finding statistics that would help make their state you know, win the next round. And once they, um, they were put, the US census sections the United States into, I think nine divisions and four regions or something like that. I forget exactly what it is. So once they finish their first layer and they upload that to me through Turnitin, they then meet with their, whatever the nine is, whatever is division or whatever. So they meet with their divisions and they debate it among themselves and decide on one state to send to the division round. So now I only have to look at nine projects instead of, you know, all of them. So then they go to the next round and they kind of hone their data from that first thing. And they go to the regions where there's only four. And on the last day of class, we decide which state gets the, the, um, COVID planter. It's like a supposed to be like high tech. And so you need really good graduates from high tech program. You need some lure in the state. And some of them got super creative with what are they, they came up with new like indices to measure how their state would fare and like that. So it was kind of a good, I liked how it came out. Um, definitely could use refinement, but that's one idea so that you don't have to grade as many projects maybe. And, but I don't, I don't know. That was one thing. And then the other point I was going to make is the blended classroom for statistics was a horrible, horrible experience. So if you're the, I forget who it is that said that they have a blended room. I just thought it was a nightmare because stats is all word problems and it's all reading. And if you have a lower level kid who's not that skilled at reading, trying to reason through the problems, it's very challenging. So that's why we split. We don't have stats for anything other than honors at our school but like I said we're a small school and they made well they made they told me I came back to school last year or the year before and said all right we just changed it it's called data analytics now and I'm like what they're like oh you can just use the same book and all this and it's like okay totally did it it was very difficult but it's all project based and that's so the kids are getting a ton out of it it's like a super good class um so those are my two things. One is that blended class for stats, I don't think it works very well for any level. And then for a project, doing something where it's like a round robin or whatever, where you pyramid it up so you maybe don't have to grade so, so much. That's Or group projects. It's kind of a group. I mean, they are responsible for that first level. Um, and if you get a really good rubric, it's like less hard to grade them because it's kind of like, check boxes. Like, I don't know about you guys, but as a stats teacher, I don't like to like read like a lot of like, I don't know, we're not used to like English paper type things. So I have a very structured result. So I can almost just high level look, okay, yeah, they met that requirement and this requirement, and this requirement, and then spend more time looking at how interesting they got with their calculations and, and their graphing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but Allie, the, the key is, can you make it group projects? It has to be individual. Really? It's a, it's a graduate. We're making it a graduation oh requirement. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing. It would be a year long thing is what we're looking for. And oh. it's something oh. that they're passionate about. 
Okay, so this wouldn't work. My thing wouldn't work. No, but I like your idea for review type stuff. I think that might be a lot of fun. To do yeah, that too. So I don't know. I'm still not 100% sure on the details. We're still working it out, but yeah. we'll see. But yeah, it would be 36 separate ones. Wow. Well, maybe if you could include, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make a suggestion. So, yeah, uh, a lot of, if you could include a lot of peer review, like have students mm -hmm. work on teams to support each other. I mean, we just finished, um, they did an exploration project because we're not AP stats. We're advanced stats, but not AP stats, but we're trying to cover a good chunk of the AP curriculum. But I wanted to, the school is very into design and letting students have choice over mm -hmm. um, what they do. So we're doing exploration projects each cycle. And so the students just finished one on what does data look like? So data visualization types of things if they want. And so they're all doing different, ex well, there was choice of three or they could pick their own exploration project um, to do. And it's been very manageable because they got in sort of peer review teams and have been really supporting each other. In I didn't even really look at the first drafts that they did. They've done peer reviews in their teams. They're turning in um, their final projects with the benefit of that feedback and having made revisions tonight. So hopefully they'll all look good. <laughs> we'll see. <Fingers> crossed. <laughs> but cool. Yeah, I really love that idea of peer reviewing in teams. I think that would be super huge and helpful. Thank you. Or what about like different questions, but it would be all like one instrument. So they could, they could each be responsible for an investigative question mm -hmm. and then something, you know, I don't know. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Like, like the census at school questionnaire is mm -hmm. I think 40 questions. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could do something similar, like create a census questionnaire. Gotcha. Yeah. Have you have have you seen that on the? Uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll plug it. It's on the ASA website somewhere, right? Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. So that would be a, that would be a good base a baseline. Yeah. Cool. Anybody else have fun things that they're doing? Things they're loving. Besides the, the students. <laughs> so um, I got student surveys back because I asked for feedback about what we're doing in class. And one of the things that the students um, asked for was more different types of data to work with. I am um, encouraging them for our next cycle to bring in their own data from other classes and talking to the history government um, environmental science, physics, other teachers about data sets that they might be using that our students could work with. Um, what they really liked, um, this summer the ASA had a program and Anna Ferguson from the University of Auckland talked about um, drawing draw image data, right? So we did actually the um, quick draw exploration and they loved it. They're like, we want more of this. So, um, if you all have other interesting data sets, um, you know, that would be great. And if you haven't, I think there rec there's recordings maybe of the ASA um, presentation that Anna and um, Rebecca organized it. So, uh, but they're really good, really fun stuff. The kids just really ate it up. Rebecca, were these, were these recorded? They were recorded. We haven't um, done anything with recordings yet, but it sounds like maybe maybe we need to because they, they, yeah. the presentations were really good. So we'll um, we'll get on that and find a way to share. And actually, um, we also still have the recordings of BAPS from last summer as well. And so I'll I'll talk to Roxy about that. And we um, was there one last summer? Yeah, it was all virtual. Hmm. Okay. Was that, wait, it was a year ago. Yeah. 2020, right? Yeah. 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we did, okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry. When I think last summer, I'm thinking like a few months. Sorry. Everybody. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, it was, it was, it okay. was in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't get it together for this summer, but I know. We're, we're I missed it, Roxy, just so you know. <laughs> Another source, Cynthia, is I don't know, I think some of you are familiar with, but the, um, the skew the script. Um, lessons they have some some interesting data sets that they work with in the skew the script lessons so um, if you haven't seen those that's a place to look 
very interesting data sets and tend to be of interest to students because he got his all his most of his topics from what by asking his students what they were interested in. Yeah. I would say like one of the problems I run into, especially my data analytics class, is finding data that's manageable for the students, like a data set that I can just say, all right, go here and get this. Because if we go to the census, it's often it's pretty large and technical and for the level kid for that they don't they don't necessarily have to have any um programming background or you know this is like the first time sometimes I forget like to me it's not not difficult like or any you know like someone who has just a little bit of technology it's not difficult but these kids haven't done this kind of research at all like they've done papers in other subjects but to go and just like get a ton of data and start managing that data and making it look like something. This is often the first time they're really doing that. And that's why I think these classes are, are hugely important because when they get to college, they're obviously gonna do that almost right off the bat, they'll take stats. And so, I don't know, I think um, I've started to put together a, um, a sheet that I have where I'm kind of finding data as I go along, especially stuff that teens are interested in. Um, and then I can share that later. Like I can give you the ones that I found if that's of interest to anyone, but um, I, that would be very helpful for stats teachers is to have, I think the two things that would be really helpful for me would be one would be uh, like a project bank where you could go and get ready-made projects or rubrics that are kind of already put together. Cause I've had to keep creating, I feel like I'm recreating the wheel, like always coming up with them. And then data that would accompany those that could be unique enough um, and of interest to the kids. So that that would be super helpful if there was a place to get that. Well, let me, that sort of leads to a good question. Like, what are some of your favorite data sets to use? Like, I know some of you have data sets that you use, like Lee or Roxy or Chris. Like when you've, when you've taught stats, what, what, like, what are your faves? Well, it, it changes year, year to year over time. Um, and I mean, the thing that I found I struggle a little bit with is that the older I get, which I seem to be doing at a rapid pace, the older I get, the further my interests are from my students' interests or from the students' interests. And so it's you know, the, the things that I find interesting aren't necessarily going to make the best examples. Um, but also trying to move away, trying to move into some of the more, you know, things that are more socially relevant, um, working on revisions, trying to replace some of the examples and with things that maybe, you know, have non-binary gender choices and things like that. Um, the ones I'm working on right now are, um, uh, in regression, a, a modeling fire spread, which is a big thing in California, you know, just looking at the relationship, because there's a lot of data out there now on relationship between wind speed and fire spread. It's complicated, you know, it's overly simplified for the intro course because there's, it's really a, a big multivariable, multivariable thing. And then the other thing that I've been working on lately that I really like that's been a challenge is partly prompted by the gaze recommendations about multivariable, introducing multivariable thinking is um, introducing basically putting together a unit on um, not necessarily creating um, multivariable graphical displays, because I think that, you know, you, that requires different levels of technology, but, but just finding really interesting examples of multivariable graphical, you know, data visualizations um, that students can grapple with and try and interpret. So, um, and there's, we're finding, you know, a number of places that are you know, that are either in the public domain or, or licensed under Creative Commons so you can, can use them. But I find that's been, that's been fun. Well, you talk about not, you know, your interest not being the same as your students. Dash that wrote, that write or wrote, has been writing, skew the script, can't be more than his late, his early 30s. And even some of the things his students were interested in and you know, there's not anywhere near the age difference between Dash and his students as me and my students um, were things that he wasn't interested in. You know, like, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 
people who are basically making their living off of uh, things like uh, Instagram and TikTok and stuff like that. He's not in the least bit interested, but his students were very interested in that. So, yeah, I know what you're, I know what you're talking about, Roxy. That's why I think the suggestion to the script is an excellent one because he talks and he has good data sets and he also talks about where he gets some of his data and gives you some ideas on that too, so. Yeah, and then Rebecca's saying that the, uh, uh, the fall data competition uh, is about housing and, or no, food insecurity. So that might be interesting for people to look at. I think the census at school uh, questionnaire, I know I, I realize that it can be gener you know, generic. I think it always generates very interesting conversations. And traditionally it was my last day activity to do the data collection. So I, I, I like to use that data set. You can um, randomly sample the the questions and it's messy data. I mean, you, you might wanna look at it and clean it up a little bit, but um, it's a good place to start. Um, I also use presidential data in my class, which is a weird because it's a population, um, but you get all the variables. You get nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. You can, you can fit them all in there. So that can be really interesting. Um, and then but what data set is that one? Because we do, I do have I a mean, project. The presidents, right? Their ages, their the year that they were uh, inaugurated, their names, and then the number of the president. You, you know, already oh, so there's not four, just one. Four variables, right? Because so we already you have you have a, a lot of things that you could you could do with that. Um, yeah, I had them. That's one of the projects I have them do as presidents. And so it's like when they're first learning the graph stuff. So everybody has like the same stuff in the beginning, but then everybody has to choose one unique concept about the president to, or about the presidents. So that's why I was wondering where you got it, because then it gets a little harder when there's like a lot of kids and everyone has to choose like a different thing to come through. So I don't know. So they came up with some interesting there's something there's data sets like that on NBA players where it's got their you know salaries, their ages, their heights, their weights, where they went to school, and stuff there's like that. The cereals, where it's yeah. you know, the sodium, the type, the shelf it was on, right? Who who's got that data? I forget where I found that. There's all kinds of really good places that you can find stuff like that. Whatever I feel like everybody has their favorites. Um, and Roxy, you said two years ago that students like talking about what did you say animals well, yeah so we, when we were at we Climate asked teachers what, what kinds of examples are your students yeah. interested in and the advice we got which seems to be the one thing that's holding true is is that they're interested in animals the environment and themselves and so I'll if you get food you know, if you work I'll on those food, food huh? right food food food, food. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anytime you can ha hand out M and M's or Oreo cookies, they are they're with you 100. percent Yeah, but you know, I can do that now. Struggled, yeah, and I've struggled. And so this is this is the one thing I love Dash and I love his website. But sometimes I go, damn Dash, you know, because he he had a profound impact on the kinds of activities I feel like I can do now. Because he because of the story he told and his published in Statistics Teacher about you know about you know the you know, going to a, going to a workshop and learning how to do activities with M&Ms and thinking, thinking this is not going to mean anything to my students. And, and then to the story of his student who, who, you know, who just basically walked out, you know, uh, of an M&M &M activity and never came back to school and stuff, because it just doesn't. And so, so it's like, I go, damn, you know, I have all these good activities that I don't, I'm, I don't like. I've to had do, you know, never but, had kids not like M&M activities. Well, but the thing wow. is, but you wonder what they're taking away from it. If they're not, in, if, they're engage, if they're engaging with it because it's M&M, because they're getting candy or whether they're actually taking something away. So we did a session at, um, I guess at US or ECOTS. Was it ECOTS that just was here or US COTS? I can never remember since, since US COTS went online. It's, I can't remember whether it's the electronic one or the real one, but we did a, a workshop, a pre-conference workshop there with the folks that I work with here in California um, about context swapping, about how to take this, I have this great activity that's M&Ms, but now I, I don't feel like that that's me, you know, that I wanted, I want, and I love what I ask students to do and what I ask them to think about, 
but the context, the M&Ms is not a, a relevant context, you know? And so, so we did this whole session about how we've taken activities like that and did what we called context swapping. So we just went through and said, I love this activity. How do I swap out? You know, how do I swap? And we, we did examples where, you know, you could have several different, you know. What do you swap it with? Well, I mean, we swapped it. We swapped it with the Flint, uh, the Flint water, um, not the on Dash's website, it's uh, proportions, but there's actually a lot of data. We swapped it with water quality. We swapped it with um, uh, with fire spread. We swapped it with, you know, we swapped it, not, not the fire spread isn't the M&M's activity, but, you know, we took examples of activities that we really like, but that we felt had superficial contexts. Yeah. Um, we liked them for what we were asking students to think about. And then we, you know, we sub, we showed how we, you know, we kind of subbed out. We use there's those um, the really inter some interesting data now on these um, guaranteed income projects, like in Stockton and Stockton, California, where they were uh, they recruited, um, you know, where they gave people a guaranteed monthly income for a period of time, um, and you know, kind of looking at that you know, what, you know, the critics who said, well, if you, you know, there's no incentive for people to work if you're giving them a guaranteed income and all of that and looking at all the, the different things. So we, we did one with that. And so it's, it's kind of finding an interesting context that you think students would engage with and, and that has meaning and think, okay, so which of, which of the activity, you know, I want to still make this into an activity, not just a, a homework problem, you know, um, how do I, you know, where does it fit? And so it was, it was interesting, but it was an interesting thing to try and say, let me just take that M&M &M activity and say, here's, here's what I used to do on, you know, um, on M&Ms and, and say, you know, it's really not that hard. You know, you don't have to throw it away and start from scratch. Um, you can just replace the context and you can give them M&Ms if you want you know, here, here, have a bag of M&Ms that'll help my student evaluations <laughs> because there is an interesting study on giving chocolate um, and whether that improves your student evaluations or not. So there's a very interesting paper on that, but so still give them, you can give them a bag of M&Ms, but you can make it. Yeah, See, I never make... liked the candy activities because you constantly have to buy candy, which if you have 130 students gets very expensive. Um, there's um, one where you melt chip chocolate chips in your mouth and you compare chocolate white and uh butterscotch chips so you're only buying you're buying like one bag of chips for two you know for all your classes because there's I the know, whole but then there's always the diabetic student or it's during eid or it's you know like i don't know i just it always ended up that it was never a convenient and i just feel like it would be one thing that i would have to remember to buy i don't know i like i like i like stuff that i, I already have or I can buy it once and then have it. And then, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm trying now for activities and examples where I could answer the question. If, if a student asks me, why, sh why do I care? Mm. Um, that I would have an answer, you know, why, you know, why is this something I should spend my time? It's kind of the whole common core, the work worth doing thing. If you're, if you're asking me to do this work, you know, is it, is it going to be work worth, worth doing? And so, you know, like a lot of activities, you know, one, my good friends, Beth and Alan, you know, their Gettysburg address, you know, sampling activity and stuff. And, and, and I just don't have a good answer for why do I care about oh, the, the same activity as and as the, you know, yeah. yeah. And so, but they're good activities. And so the question is, how did you, how do we take those activities and put them in a context that makes them worth work work worth doing to learn what we're trying to to learn and i think students i mean i think the end payoff is that students do they you know they i think if they engage with it that they you know that they really do you know do remember and do learn what we're hoping that they would they, well, would they tend to it. stick with it if they feel it's got some importance to them Mm -hmm. Do you so have that versions of that of that activity too? There's the the Federalist Papers, the Gettysburg Address, the Beyonce Beyonce, song. Beyonce lyrics. Yeah, random rectangles. Random you know that. And so the, I I used different. to always do the random rectangles, but then the catch is, can you put a context um, on it? We came up with one that you know is not 
one that I love, but it's, you know, is, um, is uh, fit, you know, where we are sampling fit that the, you're looking at the fish lengths because, you know, there's recommendations about how, how many fish you can put in a fish tank, you know, that you should have in a fish tank that's actually based on the lengths of the, you know, that, you know, if your tank is this big, you shouldn't have fish more than this many <laughs> inches of fish in, in your tank and stuff. But again, it's something that it puts a, a real context onto the, you know, the sampling activity where you have this population of a hundred fish, you know, but it's not really satisfying, I don't think so. But anyway, that's, I struggle. Roxy, is there any kind of a write-up of the workshop uh, where you talked about putting the different context on that we could, that you could share with us? Oh, um, I don't know. I mean, I can, could share some of the materials from just the, because we showed, we showed basically the old, uh, the old activity and the, you know, and kind of with things highlighted about, you know, what you'd have to swap out in the new activity. I'll, I'll check with my co-presenters. The, the people that presented are the other three that do the, that um, um, work with us on the chancellor's office. The, the California Community College's chancellor's office is funded um, this, these professional development workshops, but we, but we did that for US COTS, but. And we may be doing a new one for California as well, but anyway, but yeah, I'll, I'll see if I'll check with them and maybe next time I'll. Share. So I think, let's see, it's almost, it's 519. Uh, do people wanna talk a little bit about what they would like to have? Like I, Chris, do you wanna ask this question? Like what, what would people be interested in chatting about? for this year and yes if, if there's certain topics or any any specific presenters maybe that you'd like for us to try to see if they could come and be our guest uh, what are what are big issues for you or challenges that you would like some maybe expertise to come in and share share their experiences we're we're open very much to anything that you would like for this time. So I heard some uh, people talking about differentiation. I, I've already gotten, I wrote down a projects, maybe how to set up project banks, uh, more statistics at K through 12, not just AP stat, how we can integrate more statistics across the school, school level. What else? I think um, someone said that this was true about like the chapter for stats is always the last chapter in any book. Mm -hmm. And so maybe to find a little snip to put in each chapter, like that they're forced to do, like, I, I don't exactly know what it would look like, but somehow just get a little tiny bit in every chapter of every book. So from first grade on, they're just dealing with it as just part, integrated into their um each concept so it's not separate and and then i my other one was competitions i didn't know there was a competition on that but i think that these kids are they really thirsty for competitions well they were especially with covid i don't know maybe they won't be the same now but since all their sports stopped and everything was done one of the ways that our school kind of had some teamwork that went on was having this data analytics team that i was coaching so if there were like opportunities that weren't so difficult because it, it is starting to happen it used to be whenever I'd look for competitions they were like ridiculously hard for high school kids because well high school kids are not an eight that are not AP so it's like could be ninth graders so it's like the first time they're ever looking at data or whatever so stuff that seems like probably too low dogs. Um, but but then it gives the kids room to like kind of take it so it could be kind of vague so kids that are low levels could still participate but also kids that are high level can like add and enrich it out better um i don't know that's kind of what i would really like is some kinds of competitions that could really engage them um, oh someone's saying that asa has them so i'll have to look at that because i didn't know they had those i just don't know if they're too hard for 
So what I'm thinking, I haven't looked. So I don't know if they're too difficult. I know some teachers that use the ASA format and don't necessarily okay. submit to the national competition because it's just once a year, but they use that kind of format and have a little local competition, oh. you know, where like on the poster competition, uh, teachers would have their students to do the posters and then they would have a little um, poster presentation at their school where they would invite the parents, the kids' parents yeah. and things like that, you know, so they could come and then they would, um, you know, would would award some prizes and, you know, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, you have to make it on the national level to get a prize right. kind of thing. And they said they they brought uh, the 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 kids uh, when they had the uh, the opportunity for parents or family to come and and see their little five minute presentation around the poster that they had made. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. I know. I know. For me, sorry, I, I had to drive home. But um, one of the things, um, and with our new standards rolling out here in Georgia, one of the things I'm trying to do to combat that whole putting the the statistics at the end of the unit. Um, is to, I want them to teach the statistics first, and then I want to use a data example of some kind to then embed, like she was saying, into each unit. You know, yeah, this is geometry, but there's a way we can embed data and statistics in and look at some of the geometry stuff. And there's a way, you know what I'm saying? And so like ways that we can launch into all those other units coming from a data and a statistical standpoint, because I really think it's doable. It's just about the time to put it all together. Um, but that that's just kind of, you know, the, the last year I taught, I taught 28 years in Georgia. The last year I taught, I started algebra one with data and, st algebra one with data and statistics. And every unit that we did started with data and statistics. And we looked at what is quadratic, let's look at a quadratic graph, what kind of data creates. And we, we started it and we always came from the point of data. And then I think it made so much more of the math concepts just tangible enough that they could see. Um, so that's something that I would love to see happen here in Georgia. I don't know if that's even possible. <laughs> Chris and Rebecca, maybe you guys know. Did, did the did we ever get the? There's they're they're a little bit dated, but there was a series called Data Driven Mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's older, um, old, and I think did we ever get the rights to those back and post them on the ASA website? Yes, they they are posted on the ASA website. Yeah, and, and so that might um, be a good place to look. Um, it, it like I said, it's very they're dated, but it might give you some ideas. Right. If you go to the statistics teacher website, you can actually find uh, the uh, copies of all the data driven mathematics and it was a series of books. So, uh, like one of the books was on geometry, uh, Renee, as you mentioned, there's books with algebra. Uh, so the whole, the whole uh, philosophy of these books is to let data drive the mathematics. And that's why it's called data-driven mathematics. I think Rebecca just put the link in the uh, chat to where you could find those books. Thank you, Rebecca. She's like our fairy godmother. I know Rebecca is so <laughs> she's so fast with the chats. She's like ten times faster more. than me. Oh, you need Thank a dress you. for tonight. <laughs> Thank I you so that. much. It'll <laughs> save you tons of time. Well, is there uh, some two of the biggies that we hear a lot about from teachers are technology and assessment. Are there any specific needs technology-wise or assessment-wise that maybe we could try to help address this year? I would love to chat about creative assessment. And what I mean by that is where students have to create things as an assessment tool. I, I really played a lot with that last year, and I think I think it was it was good for me and good for my students. What is that? There is there a name for this? What was that called? I don't know. I made it up. There you go. Creative assessment. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> you know, not canned. You know, not. 
And that plays a little bit, I think, of what Allie was saying about, you know, having students, um, it's not a project, but having students generate things that are, are unique. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a portfolio, putting a portfolio. Portfolio. No, like if I give a test last year, I would have my students create, they would have to generate something that showed me they understood the, the topic. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah. are you talking about like performance based test as opposed to a multiple choice? Yeah, I guess. But they have to be a little creative about it because they actually have to generate an answer. So um, we use uh, we, we use standards based grading, so that might make it easier. But for assessment, what I've been doing is short quizzes on content, just to make sure that they can, you know, know what the different measures are and um, assess those quickly. But then they also have um, I don't know if we, we call them performance tasks. But what it is is it may be, for example, we introduced Code App. And then we use, for example, one of them, the census is school data, right? So the assessment, or we called it a lab, it was a performance task, but it was graded. They were asked to pick two variables that they thought might be associated, um, use code app to graph it, do the line of best fit, interpret the y-intercept, all, all the parameters, right? And to determine and say what they say. So it was like a demonstration of, do you know what these things mean? Can you read it? And they, they liked that. They, they kind of felt that it was authentic. Some of them were like, I love this code app stuff, right? Because it's, it's very easy and it's not like the technology there isn't a barrier. It really, they feel like it's helping them. So I don't know if something like that might be useful for you. I mean, yeah, I did something very similar, but I used the um, Art of Stat web apps that okay. Chris is what are those? What are those two things, code app and oh. Art of Stats? I don't know that. So code app and uh, let's see, let's go over them. So there's code app, there's art of stat web apps, uh, and then there's stat key. Um, and then there's like uh, Rossman and Chance have some applets and then there's stat, staplets. No, wait, hold on. I gotta, I gotta look here. Staplets is correct. That's the uh, okay. Staplets. That's the one that goes with the uh, practice of statistics. Yeah, and so those are all open source. Um, so it's um, Art of Stat. Yeah, uh, Stat Key is is for the lock, lock and lock and lock, the multi generational lock family, um, and then Code App is what Fathom used to be. It's it's sort of like the new Fathom. If you if that if you've heard of that program, um, but all of those programs are are open source, so they would be really good for students to explore. The new Fathom is not free. It is not free no, at all. But it, well, that's what I mean. It's the it's they're not developing Fathom anymore. No, but the the new version is that the one that I Code App or whatever is not free. Code App isn't free. No, Code App's no, free. Not We're not close. Code App's free. No, yeah, it is absolutely free. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there might be there might be something that you could per purchase, but I don't think so. I think it's open source. Yeah, Code App is free. It's through the the Concord Consortium, so everything they do is free. Um, but like Tuva Labs is super similar to Code App, and that's not free. Okay. Okay. Code okay. mm. App is really nice for middle for the middle school level as well. Uh, I think originally when CODAP was first being developed, it was mostly for use at the middle school level, but it's wonderful at the high school level as well. It's, it's sort of a work in progress right now. Um, and then there's Stat Key. Uh, I think I mentioned that. But anyway, there's a bunch of really, really fabulous um, open source programs that students can use. And you know, like Cynthia was saying, you can, some of them have embedded data sets so you can explore. Sometimes they go with a textbook, but all right. Yeah.
Well, I think maybe we have enough. It, I, we like to try to keep it on time. Um, I think we probably have enough ideas to generate a, a, at least a few meetings, upcoming meetings. So uh, I'm going to close this out for today. Thank you so much for joining us. This is it's exciting to be back with the chats again in a new school year. And Chris, what uh, about we'll, Dash himself, Mr. Skew the yeah, Script? Yes, I actually plan on inviting Dash. Okay. To, to present at one of the meetings. Yes. So he's already on my list. Do we want to set a tentative date for the next meeting? That was my next question. Uh, typically, we go either about three or four weeks. Do you have a preference? Would you? And we typically do them on Thursday. And uh, we're wondering if this time might work a little better. We were doing them at 4 p.m. Eastern time, but we were thinking maybe 4.30 gives you a little bit more time at the end of the school day. Seems like we have a big California contingent today, so. <laughs> yeah, I think it might help the California side, the West Coast side a little bit more. Let's see, three weeks from today would be the 22nd. Uh, that's Four weeks would be the 23rd, 29th. I was thinking the 29th, but with that. That's a Friday. That? That's a Friday. Oh, wait a minute, 28th, 21st or the 28th. Do you have a preference? The 28th is, I won't be able to join. That doesn't mean you can't, but the 28th is AMATIC, which as of now well, is scheduled let's do to be in person in Phoenix. We'll see. Yeah, let's do it the 21st. Okay. I How about that? Okay. So we will schedule and, and, and a notice will be sent out to you so that you can register. All right. Well, have a good rest of the day as you go into October tomorrow. It's hard to believe it's October already. I'm so glad, guys, September. And Amy, thank you for leading the discussion today. Thank you, everybody. All right. We'll see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Yay. Good chat. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I mean, oh.